The Nintendo 64 was Nintendo's first foray into the world of 3D. And while its competitors at Sony and Sega were going the route of a CD, Nintendo stuck by its controversial decision to stick with cartridges for one last outing, thankfully removing the issue of load time, but putting a ceiling on the scope and scale of what developers could do. That said, the Nintendo 64 was an excellent system, and while its library was ultimately the smallest of all the Nintendo systems at the time, they emphasized quality over quantity. And with that quality in mind, I'm Tony with Let's Play with Brigands, and I'm counting down the top 10 best Nintendo 64 games of all time. Number 10. Perfect Dark. Starting off this list of the top 10 best Nintendo 64 games of all time is Perfect Dark. When I look at this list, I can't help but note a common theme for more than half of the entries. With four controller ports built into the system, the Nintendo 64 was rife with fantastic and addictive local multiplayer games to keep you and your friends engaged and enraged with one another for hours on end, and Perfect Dark is a perfect example. After the huge success of GoldenEye 007 on the Nintendo 64, Rare began work on a sequel of sorts. Opting to create a game based on an original concept, rather than a subsequent James Bond property, that spiritual successor was Perfect Dark. Safe for starring a female protagonist, taking place in the near future, and featuring an alien named Elvis, Perfect Dark had a lot in common with the universe of James Bond. It also had a lot in common with GoldenEye 007, as it felt like a clone in a lot of ways, and a welcome one at that. If you took everything that was great about GoldenEye 007 and threw anything and everything that you thought might have been missing from it, you'd have Perfect Dark. That basically equated to more gadgets, a much longer story, a lot more multiplayer features including AI bots, and yeah, that alien named Elvis. The game admittedly got a bit laggy at times under the weight of all this additional and ambitious content, and ultimately it wasn't quite as tight or memorable as GoldenEye 007. But for anyone who wanted more of GoldenEye 007, which was basically anyone who ever played it, Perfect Dark was a perfect solution and an excellent game on the Nintendo 64. Number 9. Rogue Squadron. After a number of just okay Star Wars titles, <laughs> Shadows of the Empire, <laughs> Rogue Squadron was a bit of a dark horse in that not many folks paid attention to it initially, or rather anticipated exactly how good it would be. This game was way better than it had any business to be. A fast-paced, space combat and arcade-style action shooter that looked amazing for the time and handled beautifully on the Nintendo 64 of all things, Rogue Squadron was the first Star Wars experience that every kid deserved. It was one of the first games to use the Nintendo 64's optional extra RAM hardware to double its resolution from 320x240 to 640x480 and it helped make the game beautiful and remains one of the best looking games made for the system. With missions ranging from escort, rescue, reconnaissance, and straightforward search and destroy, the game managed to capture a real cinematic level of drama as it ushered you from one objective to the next. The addition of a cinematic score, sound effects pulled straight from Star Wars itself, and top-notch video game voice acting really took its storytelling and sense of urgency to the next level. The game loosely follows familiar Star Wars events, but forges its own story which exists largely between A New Hope and The Empire Strikes Back, as he plays Luke Skywalker and command an elite rebel fighting force known as Rogue Squadron. You earn different medals upon the completion of each level based on your skill of play, and earning the best of the best helped you unlock hidden ships and levels, including the Battle of Hoth and the famous Death Star run. Again, after the slight disappointment that was Shadows of the Empire, Rogue Squadron was a solid title from Factor 5 and returned to form from LucasArts games, which earns its place as one of the greats for the first 3D-based Nintendo system. Number 8. Banjo-Kazooie Another one of the handful of entries on this list from the best non-Nintendo developer of the 64 era, Rare, Banjo-Kazooie felt very much like Super Mario 64 2.0. In many ways, it seemed like an arguably improved carbon copy of Super Mario 64. Like Mario, there were a set number of worlds accessible from an overworld, and like Mario, there were a set number of collectibles in each world the player had to collect to progress the story and reach new areas, with puzzle pieces taking the place of Mario stars. Even Banjo's moveset and the gameplay mechanics were remarkably similar to that of Mario, but with a few tweaks and improvements. 
Banjo's bird buddy, Kazooie, allowed Banjo to do additional moves to create a more versatile gameplay experience. There was also a wisecracking shaman named Mumbo Jumbo who could transform the pair into various creatures, each with their own unique skill set to reach otherwise inaccessible areas. This included a termite which completely changed the scale of the world around you, and a pumpkin which, you know, was orange. Graphically, it was just as bright and colorful, but everything was far more detailed in Banjo-Kazooie than the blocky, polygonal slabs which made up the world of Super Mario 64. And like most games from Rare, the soundtrack was very strong track for track and fit very well with the theme of each world. The game also had a fun, sarcastic tone to it which was very entertaining, especially compared to most games where humor never gets a thought from the developers. Making a near-perfect clone of Mario 64 would be enough to probably get you in the top 10 list alone, but labeling Banjo-Kazooie as such would be doing it a disservice. It's a beautifully crafted and wholly original game, which earns its place as one of the greatest Nintendo 64 games of all time. Number 7. Super Smash Bros. This was a game which came out of left field as far as I'm concerned. Nintendo had already established that racing with popular franchise characters was a thing for the Super Nintendo, so Mario Kart 64 felt like a natural transition and improvement. But a fighting game made up of a dozen popular Nintendo characters, and with Nintendo's anything but typical twist, proved to be just as viable and addictive. The Nintendo twist on the fighting genre essentially amounted to a fighting game on speed. They foregoed the typical finite health meter in favor of a percentage which grew the more hits you took. The only way to beat someone was to throw them off the edge of the level one way or another. The more hits you took, the farther your character would fly when hit hard or thrown, and the more susceptible they would be to being knocked off completely. While it didn't have anywhere near the nearly 100 characters you get in today's iterations of Smash Bros., the dozen character roster still proved to be nice and varied with each character having a handful of unique moves. There were also about a dozen items which would randomly warp in which typically caused a mad dash to be the first one to get it to heal up or use it against your opponent. The right item at the right moment could be a game changer. On top of all this, each level had its own unique obstacles which could prove just as deadly as your opponents if you were not paying attention. But put it all together, you had pure unbridled joyful chaos. And while it had a single player campaign, this game was made for couch co-op where you could play a free-for-all or set up teams depending on handicaps. One of those games you could easily sink hours and hours into if you had a couple friends around. This is a game which really makes me recognize the growing void in the genre of couch co-op games these days. Number 6. Mario Party Let's keep this couch co-op train going with the original Mario Party at number 6. Let me start out by acknowledging that the first Mario Party had some kinks that they worked out in subsequent games in this now sizable series. The joystick rotation mechanic is one of those all-time examples of something they probably should have tested out a bit more. Had Nintendo done so, they likely would have noticed the extreme chafing on the palm of your hand, the amount of ground-up dead skin which wound up around the joystick, and the damage it did to the stick in general. But who knows, maybe controller sales were starting to slump at the time, and this was all by design. But take that out, and this was another original concept home run by Nintendo. Putting dozens and dozens of memorable minigames, and the obligatory handful of duds, within the confines of a greater board game featuring your favorite Nintendo characters, was every bit the slam dunk that it sounds like on paper. Of course, a game like this is only as good as the strength of its minigames. Boasting an impressive 50 minigames for its first outing, the first Mario Party instantly hit on a number of ideas. Putting twists on established games like basketball or memory match to wholly original ideas like my personal favorite bumper balls, this game was loaded with classics. My one gripe is that there were a few too many single player as well as one versus three games, which generally were among the worst in the bunch. The single player games were mostly boring for everyone not involved, and not that much better for the person who drew it, and the 1 vs 3 games almost invariably seemed unbalanced in favor of the single player. There were a small handful of 2 vs 2 games, a couple of which were decent like basketball, but it was typically the 4 player games which were substantially better than the rest. There's such a gap between the quality that there's almost always a collective groan when a wild card spot to dictate which type of game you'll play goes in favor of a 1 vs 3. 
As you played through the game, each time you accrued more coins and stars, which would allow you to purchase your favorite minigames and play them on demand. So if you didn't get the game you want in a regular match, you could always play a short tournament featuring your favorite games after. While they made a number of tweaks and slight improvements in subsequent Mario Party games, I'd argue they added a few too many features, and it was the simplicity of the first game which helps to make it my favorite overall one, and one of the best couch co-op games all around for the Nintendo 64. Number 5. Star Fox 64 Star Fox 64 was the first Nintendo 64 title which I really looked forward to. Launched in June of 1997, it was an improvement upon the original Star Fox and even raised the bar for the console's own library in every conceivable way. The first level was basically a rehash of the first level of the original, and you almost got the sense that this was by design by the developers to demonstrate how they had always intended the universe of Star Fox to look, sound, and feel. My use of feel here is deliberate as well, as this was the first game to utilize the clunky but immersion-adding rumble pack. The game came bundled with the rumble pack, a device which connected to the back of the Nintendo 64 controller and provided vibrations which triggered during pre-programmed moments in the games which supported it. This mechanic has since been implemented in virtually every modern generation's controller since, but it was the rumble pack which started everything. Sure, it added a few noticeable pounds to the weight of the controller, but it made you feel like you were there as Fox McCloud, taking the shots or feeling the effects of your afterburner. The inclusion of the rumble pack with Star Fox made this easily the most expensive game I had ever bought at $80, making me wonder where the hell I was getting all this money as a kid to fund my obsessive 64 addiction. Star Fox 64 was the first game I can remember playing, which had an intense, cinematic feel which I dove headfirst into. The realistic for the time graphics, the surround sound, the effects of the rumble pack, and perhaps most importantly, a very solid voice acting cast performance all added up to a dramatic experience each time I sat down to play through the game. The developers were clearly going for a more cinematic experience, and even blatantly filched a scene straight out of Independence Day, a popular film at the time of development, in which you had to defend a base from an enemy mothership. This was one of the coolest levels as it boasted one of the handful of times the linear level design was replaced by a square sandbox in which you could truly take advantage of your three-dimensional atmosphere to pull tight 180s and double back to destroy the mothership's core while dozens and dozens of ships flew around in the background. There was truly nothing like Star Fox 64 at the time, and it really made me lament that there weren't more voice acted games on the Nintendo 64 or in general at the time. It was truly one of the greats. Number 4, Mario Kart 64. For those of us who played Mario Kart for the Super Nintendo when we were kids, it was a great game. For those of us who played Mario Kart for the Super Nintendo since then, we know what a difficult to control mess that it was. Fortunately, they fixed literally everything that was wrong with the original Mario Kart to make one of the best games for the Nintendo 64 in Mario Kart 64. This notably meant vastly improved graphics, and most importantly, vastly improved controls and much tighter handling. The power sliding was well conceived and, if used properly, allowed you to hug turns and even give you a slight speed boost when used effectively to edge you ahead of your competitors. The course design was also a huge improvement with tracks that I still know like the back of my hand. There were four different cups featuring four courses each, and three initial difficulties which you could race alone or with a friend. You got different amounts of points depending on how you placed after each course, and the best cumulative score after all four courses won it all and unlocked the next cup or difficulty. Like Super Sprint, this one person had to place well to advance to the next course, which gave the game an element of co-op with a friend who could go out of their way just to screw the second place CPU driver up and ensure that you moved on together. After you beat the various cups on 150cc, you unlocked the ability to race the courses in reverse mode. This yielded some interesting consequences, with the prime example being driving against traffic on Toad's Turnpike. The battle mode was one of the best features of the original Mario Kart, and this proves just as true in the sequel. Here you traverse a handful of special sandbox maps in which the object is to pick up shells and other offensive power-ups in order to hit your opponent and remove one of their three balloons while trying to protect your own. This mode proved highly addictive and was another one of those games you could throw hours and hours into without realizing it. 
With nearly a dozen sequels in the franchise today, Mario Kart 64 was the first game that really got it right and showed what go-kart racing on the Nintendo was capable of. Number 3. GoldenEye The summer of 1997 was interesting for Nintendo 64 owners. Most of us had earmarked the entire season as the time for saving up for and subsequently buying and playing the heck out of Star Fox 64. It was that anticipated that it took up the entire summer's attention for a lot of kids. As an avid reader of Nintendo Power at the time, however, I was clued into and quickly grew an obsession for another game, which was set to release in a couple months after Star Fox, in GoldenEye 007. I don't think anyone, developers included, anticipated how well this game would sell or how crazy addictive it was for anyone who played it. The single player campaign mode was ridiculously fun, with 20 or so unique levels which basically mirrored the plot of the equally solid film which had come out just a couple years earlier, this was the best first person shooter I had ever played at the time. You could play it stealthy or go loud on many of the levels as you completed set objectives to clear each level. The objectives were varied and saw you doing everything from setting or disarming explosives, getting entry somewhere undetected, or protecting and freeing hostages. There were also three basic difficulty settings for each individual level, with the more challenging involving more objectives becoming unlocked only after you completed a level on the easier modes. Completing the game on the hardest difficulty unlocked 007 mode, meaning you could change key details about yours and your enemy's health and damage done and their accuracy to make a completely realistic one or two shot death experience for both you and the baddies. There were also a number of time challenges which unlocked dozens of hilarious and fun cheat modes, from paintball to big head mode. Getting through the facility level in less than 2 minutes 5 seconds to unlock the invincibility cheat remains one of the most satisfying accomplishments as a kid for the calendar year 1997. The invisibility cheat was another interesting one, one which completely changed the game as you could observe entire levels worth of enemies and their completely different behaviors had you never trigger their attention. But I've buried the lead when it comes to what makes GoldenEye 007 so great, as it was the best split-screen deathmatch experience at the time and would remain so for years to come. That's pretty crazy considering the multiplayer feature was just something they threw in at the last minute, months before release. As the Nintendo 64 had four controller ports built in, you could play deathmatch games with up to three of your friends, or better said former friends, after playing this. There were dozens of levels to choose from and even more characters, plus a handful of different modes of play to choose from which would dictate the rules for the game as well as the weapon selection. I literally spent days playing the multiplayer mode of this game with friends as a kid. I cannot overstate how addictive this damn game was. Just a non-stop cycle of game after game of close matches with one friend always coming out on top and the others pushing to go one more time. While this game influenced an entire generation of first-person shooter deathmatch games, it hasn't aged especially well in the 20 plus years since it launched. While it was graphically gorgeous for its day, that's where it fell behind the most in recent years as character and level animations now seem more blocky, blurry messes, and splitting the screen just emphasizes this. I still had a great time playing the single player campaign for the channel a few years ago, and it's worth acknowledging what an impact this game had on first person shooters even to this day. Number 2. Super Mario 64 Super Mario 64 is one of the best games ever made. Full stop. It had to be. This was Nintendo's sole launch title and everyone's first exposure to Nintendo's made Third Dimension. It's unheard of today, but when the Nintendo 64 launched, there was literally only one game that was done in Super Mario 64, and subsequent games rolled out one at a time in days, weeks, and months after the launch. You could probably count on two hands the number of games out by Christmas that year. Anyway, one more sizable tangent in the form of a personal anecdote. I did a lot of errands for our neighbor to save up for the two or three hundred dollars it cost to get both the Nintendo 64 as well as Super Mario 64. This is actually the first Nintendo console to not be packaged with a game. I reserved my console and game at our local Toys R Us, rest in peace, purchasing the pre-sale ticket weeks in advance and showing up ticket in hand on September 29th, 1996. 
I'm going to sound very old now, and while I'm sure there's probably some kind of equivalent for kids today, there was nothing like the electric feeling of walking that pre-sale ticket up to the kiosk, which kind of resembled a bookie's counter <laughs> as they kept all the games and systems behind a gated door to crack down on theft, and trading it in for my physical console. And in typical obsessive little kid fashion, I was enraged to learn that after picking up my Nintendo 64 with my parents and brother, that we had to stop off at Chi Chi's, a US Mexican food chain for those not in the know, for dinner, and I had to delay the most anticipated gaming experience of my young life for one more hour. When we finally got back to the house, I tore open that box and hooked it up to the family television at record speed. It was understood that the system wouldn't stay there forever, but it was the closest television in that moment. Powering it up, holding that strange yet familiar controller, and hearing Mario assure me that he was near for the first time was pure bliss. Even my folks who couldn't give two Goombas about video games were in awe. It was a neat experience to share with them. They grew up with games like Pong and Centipede, so they were truly impressed at how far games had come in that time. But let's get back to the game. This again was any Nintendo kid's first exposure to 3D gaming. I can't speak for how it stacked up against whatever PlayStation games were out at the time, but to us it was gorgeous. Like the original Mario games, everything about Mario 64 was bright and colorful. What seemed blocky, obtuse, and basic today was revolutionary at the time, and I'd argue still holds up for what it was. The sole, near-universal complaint about the game was the limited camera, which, when you think about it, was pretty realistic in that it limited the view to where the cameraman, in this case, Likatu, could physically go. This sometimes meant having to switch to first person to see what you couldn't in third person view, or having to really slow down and plan out a jump. The scale was another element that was never before seen on any Nintendo console. Mario 64 boasted a huge overworld in the castle and surrounding areas, as well as 15 different worlds accessible by various paintings and surfaces around the castle. Most worlds were sprawling and wholly unique to the others within the game. They ticked most of the conventional environment boxes, from snow to desert to lava to mountains to water. Mario went nearly everywhere in this game. Many of them even boasted worlds within worlds, such as the Great Pyramid and the Desert World. Considering this was the first game to take advantage of gameplay in a 3D space and handled remarkably well and tight, Mario had a handful of stock moves straight out of the gate to allow him to seamlessly glide around and interact with the world around him. This included half a dozen jump moves from the Jackie Chan-like wall kicks to everyone's favorite butt stomp. The first musical score on the Nintendo 64 was beautiful and perfectly fit the environment of every world, with the water world music being my personal favorite. Effective use of processing like reverb on sound effects helped to further immerse the player in the world around them. With 70 stars needed to complete the game and a full 120 to get the secret ending on top of the castle with Yoshi, this game was also fairly deep and players definitely got their money's worth in time spent playing it alone. You can make the argument that it's the best Mario-based Nintendo launch title out of all of them, but it's certainly good enough to land the penultimate spot on this list of the top 10 Nintendo 64 games of all time. And before I share my top pick, let's take a look at some other games which didn't quite make the cut. Number 1. The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time I've gone on and on about the respect which Nintendo gives to its flagship franchises and the unprecedented quality associated with the Legend of Zelda franchise's games. If there was any doubt, just look to the fact that Zelda games continue to top best of lists despite the competition from hundreds if not thousands of titles per system from dozens and dozens of other respected developers. Released in the fall of 1998, the hype leading up to this game was massive. I could barely control myself when Nintendo showed a trailer for it before a movie I was seeing that summer. Before it was even released, this game felt like it was in another league. This was another one of those pre-sale reserve ticket pick it up the day of release classics. I got one of the early limited edition gold cartridge copies of this game which you could only get through the pre-sale. Boasting the largest environment at the time on the console, the overworld was massive and there was tons to explore. From the main hub of Hyrule Fields, players could see Death Mountain in the background, and it absolutely blew your mind to realize that pretty much everything you could see, you could reach. 
The story continued to develop and play on motifs introduced in earlier Zelda titles with wise men, the master sword, fairies, dungeons, and time travel all in the mix. Speaking of the latter, Ocarina of Time effectively made use of time travel to not only unfold the story, but create some very interesting contrasts between time periods. Notable new material included a handful of mini-games, including the surprisingly entertaining fishing area, the sometimes annoying fairy which constantly bugged you about everything, the ability to get, train, and ride a horse, and the ability to play an ocarina which allowed you to affect the environment around the player or transport them all around the world of Hyrule depending on different melodies you could play. My brother and I used the chalkboard we had to write down all the various basic melodies and 20 years later those notes are still on it. They also brought a handful of popular items back from earlier games in the series, including everyone's favorite hookshot which allowed you to pull yourself across chasms and other obstacles to reach different areas. The combat system was top-notch, with the ability to lock onto an opponent and keep them in front of you as Link did various dodges and parries before charging in for a finishing blow. The developers put a lot of work into creating memorable boss and mini-boss battles, with each one having his or her own unique weaknesses you had to discover and exploit to survive. From the Abyss-inspired Water Temple boss, to the final confrontation with Ganondorf and Ganon himself. This game took roughly 30 hours to beat, and even more if you wanted to find and experience everything this iteration of Hyrule Kingdom had to offer. Track for track, the score of Ocarina of Time is easily one of the strongest on the Nintendo 64. Whether it's the simple yet infectious earworm of Saria's tune, the relaxing acoustics of Zora's domain, or the full-on orchestral feel of the Temple of Time in the many cutscenes, this soundtrack was stacked. It was for good reason that Nintendo sold the soundtrack on CD, and it understandably sold very well. Years later, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time might not just arguably be the best Legend of Zelda game of all time, it might be the best video game of all time, period. So it easily secures the top spot on this Let's Play with Brigands list of the top 10 Nintendo 64 games of all time. So there you have it, my picks for the top 10 best Nintendo 64 games of all time. Why not let me know exactly how wrong I am in the comment section below? And don't forget to subscribe to Let's Play with Brigands for more top 10 lists, Let's Plays, live streams, and of course fun fun times.